Hello, everyone. Welcome to Next Big Future. Um, I'm your host, um, Brian Wong. Today, I'm going to talk about how close we are to perfect nuclear power. So I'm going to go over nuclear fusion fusion, and then and also nuclear fission, how they kind of relate, you know, where we are with each. I'll go over four nuclear fusion projects and one uh, nuclear fission project that I think is particularly interesting. Well, kind of like survey. Oh, you know, give you a quick summary of, of 20 nuclear fusion projects and then, you know, roughly 20 advanced nuclear fusion projects as well. And then I'll give you also the scope of uh, where we are with energy and what, how far we are from perfect right now. So in terms of energy, here's kind of how far we are from, from perfect in that we have a lot of deaths per terawatt hour of energy. And we use on the order of um, 120,000 terawatt hours of energy total, including electric generation, um, transportation, and, and industry, okay? So um, having, you know, one death, you know, we can end up per, per terawatt hour means we could have, you know, tens of thousands of deaths per year because we're using so much energy, okay? Coal, oil, biomass, and gas, they're the most <clears throat> dangerous energy sources. Um, why are they the most dangerous? Is because we are incompletely burning. And completely burning the coal with burnable dirt, and completely burning the, the oil, burnable liquid, and completely burning, um, <clears throat> you know, the biomass, because like the wood products, and then completely burning the gas. So you have the little particulates. So you have like ash, um, soot, you know, smaller and smaller pieces, and then the the actually the most deadly part is the um, particulates, which is less than you know two point five ten microns. And there's all kinds of medical studies which show that you're shortening the lives of millions of people every year by um, putting out these uh, particulates. And there's other ways, this is also very deadly. Hydropower is also, um, so the burning stuff is a thousand, thousand times more deadly than uh, the, the safest nuclear, solar, and wind. And then hydropower is still 50 times more, more deadly. There was uh, an accident called the Bang Chow Dam um, failure in China, which killed on the order of 250,000 people. Okay, so and there's other plenty of other instances, um, you know, to go over, and that's the weird thing is that that Bang Chow Dam accident, which killed 200 people, is far less commonly known than Chernobyl, which killed 50 people, or Three Mile Island, killed no one, or uh, the Fukushima accident, which um, also seemed to kill no one. It initially, may have killed one person who died from a radiation event, uh, from being exposed to radiation. So. The how much you hear about the deaths is not related to how much it's actually killing things. Okay, but we still want to get rid of the deaths from from, from nuclear, and we want to clean up the the, the nuclear waste, and we also want to um, uh, use the materials more efficiently. So perfect would be being able to have um, to use all the materials that we have as you know twenty times more efficiently having the plant walk away safe uh, so that, you know, no chance of meltdown, even though they only have three instances over 60 years, like, get it down to, to less, okay? And then set ourselves up for, you know, lower cost energy and, and brighter future. That'd be kind of perfect, you know, cheaper, safer, you know, and, and more efficient. That would be closer to perfect, you know, 100 times better. Coal power, 40% of our world emissions, we use about 8 billion tons of it per year. It generates 15 billion tons of CO2. So more uh, CO2 than um, the mass of the coal because you're adding on oxygen. Oxygen is you know, heavier, so you can, you know, it generates more CO2 and then all those deaths from the particulates. The, the, you see in London, 1951 uh, had the London fog where uh, weather trapped the, the, the pollution and then 14,000 people died over the next week. You know, because, you know, literally, you know, lips turning blue, falling down dead. Uh, China and in Asia also have super uh, bad air now, um, you know, visibly bad air. And it's these particulates and, and, and pollution that you're forcing everyone, including babies, sick people, and the elderly to breathe. So it's like an equivalent of multiple cigarettes per day in the worst air pollution countries. So if you have if forced, forcing people to, to, to have cigarettes, you know, people die. Okay, that's, that's why things are so deadly, lung disease, heart disease. 8 billion tons of material for the coal, you know, billions of tons of material for oil and gas, versus 65,000 tons per year of the uranium. 
Um, so coal power is better than poverty, but we can stop World War II levels of illness and death, you know, move on beyond that. Poverty can kill twice as much as, um, as uh, from air pollution. And then get the lower cost of energy for economic growth that we need. From over the last um, um, 80 years, we've grown 15 times in terms of like more energy and um, more materials, more steel, something like that, compared to World War II, even though technology seems not that hugely different. The, the things look kind of the same, but we have a lot more of it. And we will have, can you have more of it? And the more we have, the richer and better that we will be. So we want to have low cost energy. And that would be part of the equation of getting to perfect energy, which um, the molten salt fission or nuclear fusion, if we solve that, could, could, could be part of it. So an overall overview is that I'll discuss um, four key, new, I, I find most interesting nuclear fusion projects, but all the 20 some nuclear fusion projects that, that exist are behind where nuclear fission was in 1951. This is a 1951 reactor. So you had the, the first reaction getting a half watt and some things in nuclear fusion never even generated the half watt. 1951, we have this um, EBR1 reactor generating about 200 kilowatt hours, 40 kilowatt hours. And then um, the submarine reactor for the, for the Nautilus. And that all happened in 19, you know, 1952, 1954. You know, in that frame is when we had the first nuclear submarine, the first um, nuclear power plant. And then by the end of 1950, we have our first commercial plant at like 180 megawatts, okay? So rapid development of fusion, because basically you have to take a fission, because you have to just take the uranium process in a way to run like a coal plant. So that was simpler, again, the Nautilus reactor. So EBR1 on December 20th, 1950, fired up and, and powered uh, 200 watt light bulbs. Um, that was the first year. But then the next day, it was bring, getting enough power to, to power the entire building and all the lights outside the parking lot. And they used it to power you know, the nearby town. Now, Fusion has an issue with tritium in that you have to generate tritium. It, currently from the heavy water react, nuclear reactor we have, generate the tritium. Tritium does not occur in nature. So, but then there's different kinds of fusion reactions. We may not need uh, the, the tritium reaction, but the tritium is the easiest temperature-wise. You know, to use the other ones, you need five, 10 times more temperature going from like 100 million degrees up to 500 million or billion degrees. Um, so that'll be something that they'll have to deal with long-term in terms of scaling. If, if not insurmountable, you can breed the, the tritium just like we can breed um, uranium and, and other stuff like that, breed more of the, the materials that you need. You can, you can alter it with the nuclear uh, actions. So here's a list of, of about 20 uh, nuclear fusion projects, not including the ITER project, which has been going on since uh, Ronald Reagan, 40 some years, uh, still 10 years away, 15 years away from getting their, their major test system going. Um, I view them kind of make work projects never gonna do anything. And if they did succeed, they'd be making huge expensive reactors that does not solve things. You know. Huge and expensive, if not cheap and safe and, and better. Okay, uh, Kamos Fusion is going to try and make that uh, tokamak reactor, which is what the ITER project is doing, the government project, and, and um, try and make it uh, simpler. Various billionaires, Bill Gates, um, and uh, and other billionaires are, are funding that one. Trafa Energy has has almost million dollar support. So these private um, uh, fusion products have gotten substantial support, you know, helium. So I'm going to talk about um, Kamo Fusion, Helium Fusion, um, HB11, and um, Avalanche Energy. Avalanche has $5 billion. So those are the four I'm talking about. The others are also interesting. We'll talk about them other time. And then this is where the more and more uh, funding over time has gone to the private fusion companies. Kamo Energy, they're depending upon their secret sauce to, to make more powerful um, superconducting magnets. So they made a 20 uh, Tesla uh, magnet, which is double the field. By doubling the field, they can make the thing a uh, thousand times smaller. That's, that's their hope. Um, so you can see that, that this is sliced it open, it kind of looks like a orange and you have slices uh, of D-shaped D -shaped, um, um, 
the magnetic fields, those are the magnets, the magnets are shaped like a D going around, 18 of them go around for the, the demo version that we'll make in 2025, which should have, um, hope to have net energy gain, Q of, of two. But the Q is the, is the funny thing because it's the Q they're talking about is only for the plasma, which is how much energy going into the plasma, how much energy coming off the plasma, which is a very um, uh, somewhat disingenuous way of, of looking at the energy calculation because the energy that has to come out of the wall, you know, and into this thing and then come back out as electricity could be end up being a hundred times more. Okay. So they're only they're I'm only looking at this one part. I'm only looking at, you know, the tip of the spear, how much are we going into the tip of the spear, but you have to solve the whole thing, which could be a hundred times more. Um, and then getting to the reactor, the experiments could take years, which is something known by a critic of fusion, Daniel Jaspi, who says that you know, it took 10 years to go from hydrogen to tritium to deuterium tritium in the two actual experiments that we did. But the other guys, you know, they want to move faster. But the 2025 uh, target is when they start, have the demo reactors starting to do experiments. And the goal at the end of the experiments is to get to 10 seconds of power. Okay. So not enough power for a commercial and it's only for 10 seconds versus you need to run these things for, for years at higher rates of efficiency. But they have made a better magnet which should be a path to uh, faster and better fusion. It's not a mass produced magnet, but that's a lot of wire. Why is tube conducting special wire, 5,000 kilometers for the demo reactor, 50,000 kilometers, enough to go around the earth for, their, for the big one. And they wanna make thousands of these things. And then they have the issue of generating tritium because each one of them probably needs to use tritium. So they have to like generate a lot more um, of that tritium. So there's a lot of things to solve. A lot of scaling to do, but that's the hope that they have. And they got a lot of money behind them to solve the problem that they, they can solve. Helium energy is not holding and sustaining the fusion. They're generating a, a little bit and they're pulsing it. So hundreds of thousand times a second, they're generating quick fusion, firing two, two fusion things together, you know, and then um, having the fusion occur in, in the center. So it's getting around the problem of holding it. Because the other guy that's looking to hold it for 10 seconds, here they're saying, we're just gonna hold it for, for a millisecond or a microsecond and then fire them together. So they're getting around the problem of holding it by just pulsing it like a, a spark plug or a, a piston. And they'll fire them together at a million miles per hour. So the, the challenging things they're doing, they have made test versions of these things, four or five test version. They make a test reactor every two years. The size of these things is like two shipping containers um, late end to end, so it's pretty compact. They can, they have proof they can iterate to make uh, new test systems every couple of years. Two, three more test systems, and they get to a commercial thing. So, you know, seems like a reasonable shot. And then when they fire the two um, plasmas together, uh, they it the magnetic it generates a more, its own magnetic field, pushes it against the device in the magnetic field, and that generates electricity according to Faraday's law. So it's a direct generation power. It doesn't have to turn a turbine. It's like magnetic field, magnetic field, electricity. Uh, third reactor, fusion reactor, avalanche energy. These guys are interesting because they're taking microwave parts and a part of a very common uh, lab device and then going to make a fusion for propelling a, a spaceship, right? A, a, a small satellite mover. So this is interesting because it's kind of like Tony Stark in Iron Man 1 taking a box of scraps, part of a microwave part of a lab instrument and then making a fusion device and it's making a tiny one that would be, you know, about the size of a large roll of uh, paper towel and then use it to just beat an ion drive instead of being a coal plant. So it's far more forgiving, can be far more expensive. So again, the size of a large roll of a paper towel and they have a device and they get lowered into their test facility so they can just iterate very quickly on that. Um, so HB11 fusion, that's the fourth one. They're taking laser pulses, which have gotten to petawatt level power. These things, the pulse lasers are improving by a thousand times every decade. And then they're going to use that to create the most difficult reaction, a billion degrees um, helium, hydrogen and boron reactions. So pick a second pulses. So these um, petawatt lasers are very common. A lot of labs have them. And they're going to use that to, to generate the fusion. But the key uh, lab thing that they know is 2015 is that there's an avalanche reaction, a chain reaction thing that occurs that produces a billion times more reactions. So they want to leverage that and use a second laser beam to 
for a fraction of a second generate a thousand Tesla magnetic field, which is 50 times more than the Commonwealth fusion guys, right? But for just again, a fraction of a second. So doing things for a short period of time in order to, to get to the, the fusion they need to generate power. So short lasers, short another laser to create a short magnetic field, uh, intensely strong magnetic field to contain the fusion. So for advanced uh, nuclear fission, again, there's several projects, billions of dollars of um, government money going into it. Uh, some could um, get things working in 2025, 2030. I'm looking at the, the Moltex Energy one, targeting 2030. It's gotten a bunch of funding. They're looking to make a 300 megawatt um, waste burner. So again, um, nuclear fission fuel starts off with 3% uranium-235, odd number easy to split, 238, still is left over and starts in there and still left over. And that's the, the main uh, waste material they wanna use up is the 238, but it's even number. So it's, if you have a fast neutron reactor where you're firing the neutrons faster, then you can react that uh, 238 into plutonium. So you get the 238 to absorb a, um, um, a neutron and it becomes plutonium 239. So it involves some chemistry and some physics to do that. They designed the reactor to be able to use the, uh, the, that material 238. And then they process the spent fuel from candy reactors, which already exists, or their own waste stream, remove the cladding, do some chemical process. Uh, so heat treatment first and then chemical processing. So turn it into an alloy and then um, make it into uh, something that can stick into the reactor. So it's... Um, a physical step, uh, a heating um, alloy making step, and then a chemical step. And the key to their being, this being inexpensive working is because they can handle a lot of um, impurities. So, and then they've gotten to a uh, design review. So this could be a walk away safe reactor in the 2030s, uh, first one in 2030, so eight years from now, that could uh, use up all of the, the nuclear waste that we have once they scale this up. Um, so we see that the nuclear fusion, looking at the 2030s probably, barring breakthroughs from HB11 or uh, avalanche energy, uh, or um, the, um, in, in, in 2030s may not be in, um, where it happens, but we're hoping for the 20, late 2020s for the advanced uh, nuclear fusion uh, reactors, which would be a far more perfected form of uh, nuclear fission. And, there are plenty of other um, nuclear uh, fission projects. Um, just you know, go through some slides where I just show that these are there. I'll have some materials available, which in the links to show where all these other ones are at. Um, but anyway, I, I have reviewed all the, um, the fusion and the fission projects. And so hopefully in late 2020, we could get to a perfected form of uh, nuclear fission. And then 2030s, maybe get the, uh, the first uh, perfected uh, nuclear fusion project. Uh, thanks for your time and um, like and subscribe and um, follow me on Patreon. Thank you. Bye.